just feel the kindred spirits of those that had passed through going to freedom. You always had a movement toward freedom because it's natural to want to be free. Rich Newberg reports. Tonight, The Road to Freedom. With contributing reports from Milos Hairston. Preserving black history in Western New York. This is sacred. My ancestors were here, and, and they made it possible for us to be here, and our children need to know. Good evening. There are times in history when great movements shape the destiny of a people, a time when passions for an ideal are shared by those willing to devote their lives to that ideal. The abolition of slavery was this kind of a movement, and Buffalo was in the heart of it. 150 years later, a new movement is beginning to take shape, one that preserves history, but also makes it come alive. Sacred places like this untouched area of the Michigan Street Baptist Church, where runaway slaves were hidden, are being protected, allowing us to connect with the past. And people are coming from all over the country to connect with our history, creating a heritage tourism industry that may help shape our economic future. Now, you may not be aware that it's happening, but after tonight, you may begin to understand what others know about us and why they are so eager to experience the road to freedom. Sometime in the water, sweet Jesus, he carried me. To this day, we struggle to understand how a country founded on principles of freedom could have allowed the enslavement of another human being. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. But only a cause as basic as freedom could have ignited the passions of people willing to risk all for a fellow human being. People whose calling often came from the Almighty. For many times, it was through the churches in places like Buffalo where fugitive slaves found comfort and safety on the road to freedom. The Michigan Street Baptist Church still stands as more than just a monument to the abolition movement. It is still an active church, now Pentecostal. Its congregation is very small, but its bishop, whose grandfather was the son of a slave master and a slave, has all the fire and passion of ministers who inspired so many generations before to seek higher ground in their lives. What keeps us coming? What keeps us giving and keeping these doors open, keeping us out of the red, making sacrifices and giving a little more than what we would have given if we were in a larger congregation? Because we realize I'm not doing it for the pastor. I'm not doing it for the officers of the church. And what I'm doing is not in vain. I'm doing it for the Lord. Hallelujah. When I hear that mournful sound. In 1845, blacks who had made their way to Buffalo from the south and settled here built the Michigan Street Church themselves. The first time here, something like this had ever been done. It had been built from the ground up. Even some of the early 20th century churches, black churches, were storefronts or they bought churches that formerly were white churches in their communities. But uh, for a long time, Michigan Street was one of the few uh, black built institutions in the community. And they, they took a special pride in that. The church would come to play a vital role in the Underground Railroad. Five years after it was built, President Millard Fillmore, ironically a Buffalo native, put teeth in the Fugitive Slave Act to try and keep the South from seceding from the Union. The church on Michigan Street would be a final hiding place for escaping slaves, who would then be ferried across the Niagara River to freedom in Canada. To think about it being a place of security, a place of hope, hope, that's the main thing, hope. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, the chains are going to be broken. Uh, I'm going to be set free. I'm going to be my own. 
You see, and and I believe this is the thing that identified this church. Some say the church owes its own survival to divine providence. It somehow escaped the wreckers ball as past members chose to move to new locations rather than tear the old church down. Few will deny there is a living spirit here, a feeling that is overwhelming to those who truly want to connect with history. These walls speak to you. They talk to you. I feel it. I think they're talking through me right now because I feel so proud of this place. It's like, I, I, I love this place. <laughs> you know? Kevin Cottrell, who calls himself the station master for the Western New York links to the Underground Railroad, has introduced tourists from all over the country to standing treasures like the church. His Michigan Street Preservation Corporation had found the money to fix the crumbling roof, but the congregation didn't want it. Cottrell's group also wanted to restore the entire church. All we want to ever do is to be the stewards of this church, which means that our job as stewards of this church is to maintain it, it's, it's in historical integrity to raise funds to restore it, and that's as far as we go. But some members of the congregation are a little leery that their church could become more of a money-making museum than a house of worship. I see tourism as okay. That could be our, actually our, our, our gift horse, actually, uh, as for outreach for the church to put the, the church on the map to make people aware of it. But at the other side of the coin, we want to be careful that we don't put aside spiritual things and the house of God for just tourism dollars and, and, and quite frankly, money and greed. I don't want to hear all of your great dreams and visions and you're doing nothing. Bishop Henderson understands how much the church means to his flock, but also believes help must be accepted in order for the church to survive in this century. We have to come to the, to the bare facts that we can't do it ourselves, that we need help, and we have to recognize the help when God sends it and accept it without any qualms, you know. The future of this old historic church may provide a vision for the future of the city, which may come to depend in part on heritage tourism for its economic revival and perhaps for its very identity. If you do it from the economic point and that's all you see, it doesn't work. But, it, but if you're good at what you do and you give your life and your, and your love and your passion into it, then the economic end that derives from that will take care of itself. I, I, I believe that. This is what my mother played on, this is what I played on. Jesse Nash is taking a walk back in time. He's walking through the home he was born in and recalling childhood memories. He's also helping others rediscover the legacy of his father, the late Reverend J. Edward Nash. My dad was one of the ones who urged the development of a local uh, urban league. Uh, he was at the forefront of the uh, effort to bring the NAACP and the Urban League into existence in, in Buffalo. Reverend Nash led the faithful at the Michigan Street Baptist Church for six decades. He was one of the local leaders paving the way for change during the birth of the civil rights movement in the early part of the 20th century. In this house on a street renamed in Reverend Nash's honor, pieces of history of the struggle for civil rights in Buffalo. I suppose Mrs. Talbert told you about our meeting at Syracuse. Certainly had a great time there. They're anxious to have me return. But Former Buffalo Common Council President George Arthur reads a letter from Harlem minister and author Adam Clayton Powell Sr. to Reverend Nash. The letter is dated December 1913. Powell was a prominent figure in the early civil rights crusade. This is, you know, precious. Also discovered here, an announcement for a meeting of the Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Reverend Nash was on the committee. Another find, this letter sent by Reverend Nash to, among others, Booker T. Washington. These are among the hidden treasures of history Arthur and other members of the Michigan Street Preservation Corporation hope to find more of and save along with the Nash House. It's our only link back to the past, physical link that we can touch, we can see, and we can and come in and read letters. Most of our black history in Buffalo is, is in shreds. 
This is why preservationists feel the effort to save the Nash home is so important. It's an effort that has impressed Jesse Nash, who, by his own admission, is modest when it comes to touting his father's legacy. I'm overwhelmed. I'm deeply overwhelmed. Yeah, you know, that's what I was saying the other day. I've never been affected by anything quite like this. The goal is to refurbish this home built more than a century ago and turn it into a museum and research center for people studying black history. Preservationists say this is important because history lives here. From Reverend Nash's bookcases and desk drawers, they hope to find links to other prominent African Americans, people like Buffalo resident Mary B. Talbert, who in the early 1900s championed the Niagara Movement, the forerunner of the NAACP in Buffalo. Also, they hope to find a link to W.E.B. Du Bois, who helped lead the push for civil rights. This is my opening up a time capsule of the late 19th and the early 20th century in African American history and also the history of the city of Buffalo. Just how much history is actually here? Well, no one knows for sure because preservationists haven't started to catalog the items in this house. But they will tell you this, their efforts to hold on to pieces of Buffalo's past will lead to a better future for today's children and their children. Well, history is history. and and. To read it in the book is one thing, but to come and say, I'm standing where history was made, it means a lot. Historians say if we are to move forward, then we must never forget the past. Preservationists say the renovations here, expected to start in the next three months and be completed sometime next year, will ensure no one ever forgets the Reverend Nash or his contributions that helped shape the city of Buffalo. Buffalo's African Americans in the mid-1800s were a proud people. You had a small community, but a tight-knit community that had international connections. Ora Anderson Curry traces her family back to 1832, when her great-grandfather moved to Buffalo as a free man from Virginia. Benjamin C. Taylor would become the first African American doctor in Buffalo. Her family were abolitionists who were well connected to the great minds and organizers of the time. In 1843, there was a convention here in Buffalo, national. All black people. Black newspapers with regional or national circulations would send out traveling agents to report on cities like Buffalo. Dr. Monroe Fordham remembers reading an old account of an agent from a newspaper called The Colored American. He said that Buffalo was one of the most prominent, upstanding, uh, progressive black communities that he had come across. There was an organization uh, to help ferry people across the, 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 the lakes to Canada. And here, at the foot of Ferry Street, a group called the Buffalo Quarters Historical Society reenacts the crossing of the Niagara River every summer. Its founders had connected spiritually with the freedom movement. All of a sudden, I was engulfed by this, this history. We have so much history here that people don't even know about. Because it is international, the landing is in Fort Erie, Word has gotten out far beyond Western New York borders, as far away as England. Yet, Buffalo has yet to connect in a big way. Yes, truthfully, it has taken off, but not in this vicinity. The attention is at a distance. At Broderick Park, where the reenactment takes place, and where the river crossing is at one of its narrowest points in the region, there are plans in the works to make this place into a living memorial complete with an amphitheater, reflecting pool, and memorial walkway, honoring everyone connected with the Underground Railroad. This was not done by blacks alone. This was a humanitarian effort. We need each and every one of you now. People will be able to buy bricks with personal inscriptions that will be laid into the park. We thought the best way to get the community involved was to give them an opportunity to put their name in this historical setting in some way. After the bounty hunters left and the marshals left and they didn't find anybody, your next stop would have been to come here. Broderick Park is already on the tourist path, 
which includes original cobblestones and the stone wall that marks the historic site of the American Hotel, another refuge for runaway slaves. Authentic historical sites add a dimension to a community that helps inspire the people in that community to want to do more and be bigger than what they are. A simple marker would guide Harriet Tubman and the runaway slaves on their road to freedom. They knew what would happen if they got caught. There was no turning back on this mission. A mission of people going underground through the Quakers, through churches, through houses, and it's important that they know that the history of Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman. She is referred to as the Moses of her people for leading 300 slaves to freedom. She was a conductor on the Underground Railroad, which ran through Buffalo en route to Canada. Today, Tubman's accomplishments are front and center. You know, it makes me really feel great because growing up, the only people who really knew about Harriet Tubman was her family. Arlene Olden is one of Buffalo's living links not only to black history, but the history of this nation. Olden is the great grandniece of Harriet Tubman. I think our children need to be taught more about their own history, where their people came from. Harriet Tubman's legacy and link to Buffalo are very visible today. Behind me is Michigan Avenue, which has been designated Harriet Tubman Way. And now one of the city's oldest churches is also planning to honor the Underground Railroad's most famous conductor. Harriet Tubman was a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. She left everything she owned, including her home in Auburn, New York, to the church. And while she never attended Durham AME Zion Church here in Buffalo, members have a passion to preserve her legacy. They're planning a memorial garden. We have to remind our people, both African Americans and others, of the great contributions that our people made in the days of struggle. And collectively, we hope to have a beautiful plan and program that when visitors come to our city, they will be able to see all of these sites. The sites, Michigan Street Baptist Church, the Memorial Garden, and the Nash House, they would all be part of a proposed black heritage area. City leaders believe the heritage sites could attract thousands of tourists. Because the story of Harriet Tubman cannot be told without the Canadian connection. We all know that, right? The Freedom Trail moves seamlessly from Buffalo into Canada. Many African Americans ended up here in St. Catharines, St. Catharines, home of the British Methodist Episcopal Church. This was Harriet Tubman's church during her eight years in St. Catharines, and it's another vital link for the Niagara frontier to Tubman and the Underground Railroad. Okay, I just want to show you um, this plaque over here. On this day, a tour group from New Jersey listens and learns about the history of their ancestors. For some here, history is more than a lesson, it's life. The impact of it and the history that's behind it because of my ancestors and you know all the hardships they went through, the horrors and hardships of slavery, this church is now my life, it's, it consumes me. And what drives the people who are trying to preserve this history is the desire to pass this history along to future generations, not just during February, which is Black History Month, but every month of the year. I believe that everyone should be able to learn about their ancestry. Some black kids don't even know that there was an underground railroad. They would never even, they probably don't even know anything about the slave trade. This is why so many people are trying so hard to preserve the history, links to the past that can help shape the future. In Niagara County, you can travel the backwoods and creeks, tracing the paths of runaway slaves. People come here and they say, I want to see the Underground Railroad. And this is when I say, 
there it is. No rail tracks, just a lot of land. Carol Murphy's orchards were on the route, and she brings tourists and school kids onto her property and into her barn, where they witness a piece of history. I mean, you have to stand here and think, this is where it happened, and, and just be quiet and feel what it would have been like to walk in here. This nine by eight foot hole has become something of a shrine. It was a hiding place for escaping slaves. Here in Lewiston, there are yearly gatherings at the gravesite of abolitionist Josiah Tryon, who ushered countless escaped slaves into this family-owned house. It's the northernmost point and last stop on the Underground Railroad. The Lord has brought us together today to honor a friend, a friend none of us ever met, but we knew as a brother. Our region is filled with authentic reminders of a time that put civilization to the test. Across the river in Fort Erie, the so-called Colored Cemetery reminds us that this history is for everyone to understand. There are slaves buried in the cemetery as well as whites. It was only appropriate that Governor Pataki came to our neck of the woods, Buffalo's Michigan Street Baptist Church, to sign landmark legislation requiring the teaching of the Underground Railroad in every school system throughout the state. We're using our history and, and making it come alive. The Freedom Trail Act that Governor Pataki signed lays the groundwork for documenting and preserving the Underground Railroad sites throughout our state. And this will attract tourists from all over the country to our region. By preserving our history, we also preserve its lessons. And since freedom is the underlying principle of our nation, the lessons of black history and the road to freedom tell us something more about who we are as a people. For Milas Hairston, I'm Rich Newberg. Good night. This is the place, not the site, but this is the place where the slaves were kept and were gotten over to Canada, you know. I want to be able to say that I was part of that rebirth. They're divinely inspired. They're, they're motivated by a reason that's bigger than politics, that's bigger than anything you can put your finger on. The following is a special documentary presentation of News 4. I know she out here in these woods. And they're going to bring you back to where you belong. Beyond the Road to Freedom, a News 4 special presentation. Join Rich Newberg and Milas Hairston on the Freedom Trail as we celebrate black history and progress in making that history come alive in western New York. It's hard to imagine hiding in a place like this, a 10 by 12 foot chamber under a barn at Murphy Orchards in Niagara County. This hidden room of cemented stone with an arched brick ceiling is believed to have sheltered runaway slaves on the road to freedom to Canada. While places like this give us a tangible link to the past, a link we can touch and feel, the Underground Railroad was more about people than hiding places, more about courage than cowering in the shadow of the bounty hunter. In many cases, winter time was the best time to travel. Nobody tells the story better than Western New Yorkers because the Freedom Trail cuts right through our neighborhoods and farms. The challenge now is to tell the story to a world hungry for freedom's lessons. How we are meeting that challenge is what our special report is all about. To Becky! <laughs> to Becky! A spellbound group of tourists connects with the image of a woman once called the Moses of her people. Y'all can call me Harry Tubman. 
See, I'll be the leader of this here outfit. I'm going across this here swamp by and by. If I not say to duck, you all got to duck. If I say to get low, you best to get low. I bring many people here. And I don't go, but where God ventures me forth to go. Her visitors from the 21st century will wind through the woods of Murphy Orchards, once the gateway to the McClue farm, where fugitive slaves found refuge. Run! Run to the river! Run! Led by Kevin Cottrell, who produced this moment in history as part of his plan to draw tourists to western New York, these history thrill-seekers are about to come face to face with all that was mean and ugly on the road to freedom. Looky, looky, what we got here. Now, where do you folks think you're going? Which one of you is Herr Tubman? I'm looking for this woman. Which one of you is Herr Tubman? Speak up! I know she out here in these woods. I want you, Lord. To walk with me. But beyond the bounty hunter, they will see all that was beautiful and courageous on the road to freedom as they meet little Lizzie. I'm on this journey to freedom, and I hear up yonder. It's a big old house that's going to help me get some fresh clothes and maybe a little food as I continue on. By walking with these heroes of history, the aim is to touch people with powerful lessons that didn't come easy to runaway slaves. To put that little seed in their minds that they can be and do anything that they want to be if they just maintain their freedom in this world. It takes a village to raise a child. And freedom was the theme for these children who gave Governor George Pataki a special welcome to Buffalo when he signed a major commitment to keep the memory of the Underground Railroad alive. Today I am announcing that the state is putting one million dollars into that freedom trail to make sure that the Underground Railroad sites are preserved for the children of the 21st century and for future New Yorkers and Americans to see, experience and feel. This is the entrance to a secret room that is below the barn. At Murphy Orchards, tourists are able to see, experience, and feel what happened as escaping slaves moved toward freedom's door. That's why the National Park Service chose this site to inaugurate the country's new Network to Freedom program, which seeks to link underground railroad sites, programs, and facilities throughout the United States. People around the country are becoming aware of what Murphy Orchards has to offer, but it gives us a way to connect to the story that we don't often get just by reading a book or visiting a house. It just brings it alive. This is how I put food on my table. So one way or the other, I'm gonna get you. For Carol Murphy, all the attention from the National Park Service won't put food on her table. There's no money involved. But an inaugural announcement made from her farm means national promotion, and that can't hurt. The fact that they made it from New York State is an honor. The fact that they made it from this little farm in Newfay, New York, is just incredible. And I praise the good Lord. And people are traveling to see this stuff, and they're willing to pay. And it's not so much commercializing the history, but they're going to pay anyway. So let's do it with integrity, and I think we do that. Integrity is the mortar that has kept the old Michigan Street Baptist Church viable since the first brick was laid in 1845. I'll give you it was built by African Americans in Buffalo who wanted their own place to worship. It became a safe haven for runaway slaves, and now there is a desperate attempt underway to keep the church from falling down. When the architects came in and they went into the attic and they looked at the raptors that had been there over 150 years and they saw pins missing and they saw deterioration, they saw cracks, they said, you got to do something right away, the roof's going to fall in. Well. Five years have passed and the roof is still up. It's a miracle the church is still standing, says Bishop William Henderson, and that the money has finally been found to keep it standing. I believe that God has ordained this place 
and this is the reason why it hasn't fallen down. I believe it's going to be revived. Architect Ted Lowney believes the church is one of Buffalo's greatest unadorned treasures. It's absolutely beautiful in its simplicity. The space is almost a, um, a perfect cube, this, this worship space. It has uh, attempts at applied grandeur. It, its grandeur is in itself. Come on, come on, little one. That's right. The church's hidden treasure that these school children are about to discover is beyond a wall in the basement. A dark, damp, chilling glimpse into the past. A sanctuary within a sanctuary where escaping slaves crouched in darkness away from the gaze of bounty hunters. There was a false wall that you could move and push them in there and then move the wall. When it was safe, many moved on to cross the Niagara River to Canadian shores where they could live in freedom. I am the, Lord. the old Michigan Street Baptist Church, it seems, was meant to survive the ages and is still a house of worship to this very day, a place, the bishop says, where the spirit is yet made free. Those who love this place and all it represents will not let it fade out of history. The end goal of this is to, of course, restore it both inside and out. And I think when that happens, you'll be thunderstruck to walk through those doors and to see this austere space and to realize, you know, the, the, uh, that this was, in a sense, the promised land for a lot of people. When they came here, they knew they were safe. Coming up, the man who would lead this church into the 20th century and the incredible legacy of the Reverend Dr. J. Edward Nash. It stands alone on a Buffalo street. Age has weathered its cover, but the pages inside the former home of the Reverend Dr. J. Edward Nash have stood the test of time and are giving people a new look at life at the turn of the 20th century. Reverend Nash was a leader in Buffalo's black community. He led the congregation at the Michigan Street Baptist Church for nearly six decades. He also played an important role in the early civil rights struggle. And what he left behind here in his home, much of it now cataloged and in boxes, is a virtual vault of valuable information. The Nash House has been designated by the city of Buffalo as a landmark. But for Reverend Nash's son, this was simply home. Because it seems as though I just uh, uh, was sleeping upstairs uh, last night. It doesn't seem like I've been out of the house that long. Jesse Nash left this house in 1953. He's excited his childhood home will be restored and turned into a black history research center. And he's proud people will learn about his father. My dad, first of all, was a physically huge man, a very large man. He wasn't so deeply steeped in the Bible that he couldn't see the so-called real-world applications that were required for his beliefs. It's a look into the mind of a man who helped shape not only the black community, but the city of Buffalo. Reverend Nash was noted for memorizing every sermon and along with his wife, pushed the congregation at the Michigan Street Baptist Church to reach higher. But they were very eager activists advocates for community and for our people and it was in this home that I got my early orientation toward uh, what it means to be black in America what it means to be an American historians say the documents found here are giving them insight into life in Buffalo's black community among the papers every sermon given by Reverend Nash there are also photographs and letters Dr. Monroe Fordham is one of the people looking over the documents he calls this a treasure chest of history. And these papers that he left tell so much about the community of Buffalo during the early 20th century. That collection represents, in my opinion, the most important collection of individual papers on any Afro-American in the last 10, 15 years. Historians are finding links to some of the most important African-Americans of that time people who pushed the envelope of racial equality. African Americans such as W.E.B. Du Bois, Adam Clayton Powell Sr., and Buffalo's Mary B. Talbert. Lillian Cerise Williams is the author of Strangers in the Land of Paradise. The book chronicles the creation of the African American community in Buffalo in the early 1900s. 
Mary Burnett Talbert was perceived as the greatest leader in the city of Buffalo. Uh, Je the Reverend Jesse Nash was a prominent player. Mary B. Talbert was instrumental in forming the Niagara Movement in Buffalo. That organization eventually led to something much bigger. Frank Messiah is president of the Buffalo chapter of the NAACP. That group down in New York City came together with the Niagara, uh, lead some of the leadership from the Niagara Movement, and in a sense created the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Some historians believe Talbert did as much for women's rights as she did for civil rights. They say the documents in the Nash House are filling in some of the gaps in history. All these things are dated and they, they, were, they were preserved in a way that he must have known that somebody was going to find them and they, they would document his time period. Uh, you can just feel uh, the energy uh, from the, it, that was part of the community. Taking a closer look at the history of the community is William Senor. He's the executive director of the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society. This community was very much, uh, while in many ways separate from the white community of the day, it was, uh, it patterned itself uh, as a, a middle class neighborhood would pattern itself. The people who have seen the documents say this house, the Nash House, is an encyclopedia of history. It's going to be a, 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 a real boon for for researchers for many, many years to come. Researchers will learn why Reverend Nash was so involved with the YMCA. The Y could offer, for example, courses that African-American young people could not take in other places. They will learn more about why African-American women like Mary B. Talbert were often in the forefront of civil rights activities. The woman could take advantage of some of the situations to provide information, to provide leadership, where if the male had done that, he would have been killed. People will learn because pages of history have been preserved. History that may become a tourist attraction with the creation of a black history heritage district. The Michigan Street Baptist Church, the Colored Musicians Club, and the Nash House will be the centerpieces of black history now being acknowledged and shared. Just ahead, how black history was viewed at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, a view that was protested by Buffalo's African American community. The great Pan American Exposition in Buffalo at the turn of the 20th century reflected the attitudes and trends of the times. The Midway, with its foreign villages, promised visitors curious and interesting evidence of civilization so different from our own. An exhibit called The Old Plantation was part of the Midway, complete with slave quarters, and by today's standards, it was described in awful terms. When uh, the darkies uh, were content and happy, and, uh, and, you know, as slaves and, the, and their children were described as pickaninnies. The language today is, is abhorrent, uh, and I'm sure that African Americans in 1901 also felt repulsed by it. Another carnival-type attraction you can actually see here from the gondola was the Darkest Africa exhibit. Touted as a collection of some 35 African native tribes showing villages in their primitive state, African culture was reduced to savages with spears and a great white hunter. The African tribal members were paid to appear bizarre and entertain the fairgoers. But they were supposed to do the wildest and most savage dances that they could possibly do. And these were major attractions. It was no coincidence that Darkest Africa was placed near the old plantation exhibit. To say, actually, on, on that slavery had done a great thing for these people. So here are these wild beasts that you have in the African village. But see how docile they are, and there's laughing Ben, and he's having such a great time. And the Piccaninny children are playing. The tragedy is that 8 million people came to that fair. So they saw this, and they walked away with these images. Even before the exhibition opened, prominent African Americans in Buffalo knew about these exhibits, and they protested. They called for the inclusion of the so-called Negro exhibit, which had been 
featured in Paris. This exhibit highlighted the achievements of African Americans from emancipation to the turn of the century. The Negro exhibit did come to Buffalo, but had been forgotten over the last century until just recently. A huge Pan American Exposition scrapbook was discovered in the Buffalo and Erie County Main Library by rare book curator William Lose. Its pages were brittle. It's literally breaking as I turn the leaves. He found a pamphlet for the Negro exhibit among the many items inside. Well, the pamphlet was devoted to the exhibit of material relating to the advancement of black Americans, and that it was uh, professionally printed. Unusually, it had a lot of advertising by local companies. The exhibit featured 300 works of great black Americans, including The Future of the American Negro by Booker T. Washington and The Underground Railroad by William Still. The first time a major exhibit of material relating to the black Americans had been exhibited in any northern state. The famed Reverend Nash of Buffalo was featured on the pamphlet cover, along with entrepreneur and politician James Ross, who promoted the exhibit. The local effort to bring this federally funded exhibit to Pan Am speaks volumes about Buffalo's black community at the time. The African-American community in Buffalo at the turn of the century did have some power that we don't see um, in, in, in looking at the regular histories of Buffalo. Buffalo's African-American community would again become incensed following the assassination of President William McKinley at the exhibition. The man who shot McKinley, Leon Cholgosh, was knocked to the ground by an African-American, James Parker. Parker was then written out of history. McKinley had given a major address on trade policy the day before appearing at the Temple of Music for a reception. Sholgosh, believed to have been an anarchist, had hidden a revolver under a handkerchief in his hand. He shot the president twice. Parker, who was a waiter at the Pan Am, prevented Sholgosh from getting off a third shot. He knocked uh, Shoglis down and, uh, and held him from shooting the third shot into uh, McKinley. While Parker never boasted about his actions, eyewitness accounts of his bravery were written up in newspapers in Buffalo and across the country. But Parker was not asked to testify at the trial of Sholgosh and was never identified during the trial as the citizen who risked his life to stop the assassin. He kind of exemplifies the black uh, African-American men that have been played a part in history all through the history of America that were on the periphery or even participated uh, strongly into the, the development of this country that was kind of uh, pushed aside. The Secret Service would take all the credit for seizing the gunman. The Secret Service is, is dedicated to protecting the president's life, and when they don't do that, uh, it's uh, highly embarrassing for them, um, even today. When we come back, me. efforts in Western New York to make sure history oh, is not forgotten. Lord. While I'm on this teacher journey, I want you, Lord, to walk with me. Lord, the road to freedom comes to life in Lewiston. For many people, the Marble Orchard is opening up a new chapter in history. We found that uh, the history of Lewiston is so rich, and there are so many wonderful characters uh, that we've learned about. Those characters are actually people who played pivotal roles in Lewiston for the Underground Railroad. The Marble Orchard is actually a nearby cemetery the final resting place for people who are just now being recognized for their contributions. People like Josiah Tryon, an Underground Railroad conductor. Canada offered freedom to runaway slaves, which made Lewiston a natural destination. For our quiet little village was the northernmost depot on the Underground Railroad. The Marble Orchard Plain Speaking is a production time, that takes people through the streets of Lewiston, but there's a difference. When people walk the streets, they're actually walking on the tracks of the Underground Railroad. Then I met Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, he pulled out a sailor and got the freedom. Frederick Douglass was the leading black abolitionist and one of the greatest speakers of his time. 
In our time, Pamela Gardner teaches history as the ghost of the Underground Railroad. The people that lived in this uh, town did a lot and contributed a lot to the Underground Railroad. The Marble Orchard could just go on and on and on because there's, there's so much history to tell. Historians say it's history that hasn't been told, that needs to be told. Two of the reasons why many people say reenactments are so important. Here at Buffalo's Broderick Park, this has been the setting for river crossing reenactments for nearly a decade. Because this is my last stop, or one of my last stops, before I cross that river into freedom, freedom. I'm going to cross that river into freedom. It's a missing piece in the lives of our children. For the pain and the hurt, names being taken away, why only one month again I say. Lillian Batchelor is the driving force behind the Buffalo Quarters Historical Society. Buffalo Quarters means Buffalo residents. For Batchelor, this annual river crossing reenactment is an opportunity to educate people, especially the young. It's history of this country. And if you know partial of it, you're lacking. Because it's a history in which all of our young people should never want to see again under no circumstances. Babies gone, fathers no more, call someone master, and I'm the slave at the door. It's history that's having an impact on 11-year-old Latia Kitchen. She recites a poem she wrote when she was in third grade. She asks why February is the only month dedicated to the history of African Americans. My people worked hard, brick by brick, mile by mile. Why only one month? The commitment to history is growing. More lessons are being cultivated in this garden at Buffalo's Dorm Memorial AME Zion Church. The Harriet Tubman Memorial Garden is located along what is designated as Harriet Tubman Way. It's named after the woman who helped hundreds of slaves reach freedom. Harriet Tubman was known as the conductor of the Underground Railroad. When they come into our memorial garden, they can meditate. There will be literature here explaining who Harriet Tubman was. And it's just going to have storytellers here. And the stories told will help fill in the pages of history many historians say need to be written. Everybody that comes through here, what is? They figured to be free. Freedom's lessons are now required That's learning in New York schools. Happens. I want them to say never, never again should we ever go back to that and that we must also reach out to help the least of God's children. Y'all understand? And there's even a move underway to honor the memory of Harriet Tubman with a state holiday bearing her name. People who cannot remember their past are condemned to repeat it. We're not going back that way. These are the shores that sheltered escaping slaves and nurtured the restless spirits of great civil rights leaders who would hold our country to its promise of liberty and justice for all. Those who are working to preserve our magnificent history know that beyond the road to freedom, there are still great lessons to be learned. For Milas Hairston, I'm Rich Newberg. Good night. Woo, woo. Come on. Come on in. The road to freedom was a tedious journey. It was hard, but it, it, a lot of people made it through, and that's how we got to be where we are and who we are today. They didn't want to dwell back in slavery and look at that, but they wanted people to see that in the 40 years since uh, emancipation, African Americans have made tremendous strides. There was a dresser here, a table, a work table here, and a chair, chair here. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you very much. Professor Nash, who is um, recalling his memories here as a youth and sharing those with us uh, so that we get an accurate portrayal. With the restoration of this home, we are spurring economic development um, to an underserved community using tourism as a tool. Mind you, that has never been done before in creating an attraction on the east side of Buffalo. Oh, my hand, Lord, walk with me. All our children, there is so much they should know about this area and so much they should be proud of.
But you've got to know the vision. Has God given you a vision?